exclusive insight into one of the, this year's biggest stories, the Fukushima meltdowns. Kenichi Matsumoto is the ultimate insider. As special advisor to Japan's prime minister and cabinet, he witnessed both the government's and the plant operator's responses to the worst nuclear accident in a quarter of a century. And when it comes to the meltdowns, Professor Matsumoto paints a picture of cover-ups, incompetence and communication breakdown. He confirms that the operator of Fukushima, TEPCO, wanted to abandon the stricken plant and that the Prime Minister at the time, Naoto Khan, contemplated, com contemplated evacuating tens of millions of people from in and around Tokyo. Professor Matsumoto also accuses the Japanese leadership of knowing months ago that areas around the nuclear plant would not be habitable for decades. North Asia correspondent Mark Willisey reports from Tokyo. He's been described as the Prime Minister's brains trust, but Kenichi Matsumoto isn't a nuclear physicist or a scientific genius. The history professor and author was a special advisor to the Japanese cabinet when a tsunami slammed into the Fukushima nuclear plant. So he would become a witness to history, and he's given the ABC an ultimate insider's account of what happened in the hours and days after March 11, as three of the Fukushima reactors bubbled towards meltdown and he's damning of the plant's operator, TEPCO. First, TEPCO did not convey accurate information about the accident to the Prime Minister. It tried to make the disaster look small. Then TEPCO's headquarters wanted to evacuate the nuclear plant, but the chief of the facility vowed not to leave. So Prime Minister Khan was outraged because he wasn't getting proper information or the truth. This lack of clear and accurate information was feeding panic both in communities around the Fukushima plant and around the cabinet table in Tokyo. In the end, TEPCO was ordered to keep its people at the plant and to start feeding the government more information. Special advisor Kenichi Matsumoto reveals that the Prime Minister at the time, Nato Khan, was considering evacuating 30 million people after being briefed on a worst-case scenario. Uh, so it's true that the Prime Minister said we might have to evacuate people from Tokyo. There was no clue about the amount of radiation coming from the Fukushima plant, or if it was spreading over 100 or 200 kilometers. If that was the case, Tokyo would be in danger. And Prime Minister Khan actually said that eastern Japan might not be able to keep functioning, that it might collapse. In the end, talk of tens of millions being evacuated was dismissed, with fears it could cause mass panic and chaos worse than the nuclear crisis itself. But at the time, what was collapsing, or more accurately, melting, were the fuel rods in reactors 1, 2 and 3, after they were left fully or partially exposed. In less than 24 hours, the number one reactor core had melted and burnt a hole through the pressure vessel. It wasn't until three months later that the Japanese government confirmed that the outer containment vessel had also been breached. But special advisor to the cabinet, Kenichi Matsumoto, isn't just critical of TEPCO's handling of the nuclear crisis. He's also scathing of the then Prime Minister and his former boss, Nato Khan. I don't think he handled it well, because it was such a terrible accident. Information should have been shared with the whole cabinet, but it wasn't. The information stopped with Mr Khan, who handled it alone. So the cabinet was isolated and wasn't able to formulate its advice properly. Mr Khan has since resigned and Kenichi Matsumoto has also left his post as special advisor to the cabinet. What remains are 80,000 people displaced by the nuclear disaster. They're now in their seventh month living in shelters or temporary housing and many are desperate to know if they can ever return to their homes. Kenichi Matsumoto says the government has known for months that thousands will not be able to return. The cabinet knew right after the disaster that some people would not be able to live in their communities for 10 to 20 years, especially those a few kilometers from the plant. The government should have conveyed the truth to the evacuees, but it felt scared, it feared telling the truth to the people. Kenichi Matsumoto has now left politics for the more sedate world of academia returning to his history post at a university outside of Tokyo. But he's still determined to write the history of the Fukushima nuclear crisis 
from his unique perspective from the inside. This is Mark Willisy in Tokyo for PM. And we approached the former Prime Minister Naoto Kan for a response but received no reply. A spokesman for TEPCO told us that the company never tried to downplay information about the nuclear disaster but did acknowledge that there were mistakes made and some confusion at the start of the crisis. Fukushima Prefecture, or rather Fukushima City in the prefecture, plans to remove radioactive materials from all private houses. The move was decided after high levels of radiation were detected in some areas. The city is located about 60 kilometers from the crippled Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. Some people concerned about possible health risks to their children have already moved out. Fukushima plans to decontaminate all 110,000 households over the next two years. The goal is to lower radiation levels in the air. Professional cleaners will scrub radioactive substances from roofs and low-lying areas. They will also remove concrete, which radioactive material tends to adhere to. But residents will be required to remove surface soil and weed gardens by themselves. It has yet to be determined how the contaminated soil and other materials will be disposed of. The Japanese government is coming out with. We don't think that they're right. I mean, I've measured more radioactivity in a car air filter than they are measuring in a child. And the car breathes air in the same way as the child breathes air, so I don't really believe what they're saying. That's the first point. So we need to have independent testing. And secondly, we need to try and do something about these children who are being contaminated. There are two things we can do. The first thing is we can take them away from the areas of contamination and put them somewhere where it's reasonably safe. But that, re that, that leads us to another problem, because what's happening now, as I'm told, is that the Japanese government are trucking radioactive material from the Fukushima disaster area, where it's contaminated, all over Japan. And even as far south as the south of Japan, we're now getting reports of, of uh, radioactivity, uh, radioactive material being taken all the way to the south of Japan to be burnt. Now, what possible reason could there be for burning it as far away as that? I'll tell you the reason. It's really quite sinister and horrifying. The reason is this, that eventually when these children start to die from leukemia, from other cancers, from heart disease, from whatever, their parents are going to want to go into court. They're going to want to sue the Japanese government and they're going to want to have to say, these, in order to do that, these children were contaminated and that's why they've got high levels of cancer. But of course, the only way that they can say that they've got high levels of cancer is to have a control group in an area that's not contaminated for example, the south of Japan. So I believe that the project to take this material and burn it all over Japan is to destroy all of Japan, is to increase the, the, the cancer rate in the whole of Japan so that there will be no control group to which you can compare these children in the Fukushima area. So that's that point.